Okay, <laughs> so um, for those who are just joining, I'm Susan Griffith and I'm the Florida Friendly Landscaping Program Coordinator here at UF IFAS Manatee County Extension. Um, and just briefly, we'll go over the nine principles of Florida Friendly Landscaping since that is my program and actually attracting wildlife is part of that. So um, number one is right plant, right place. Number two is water efficiently. Number three, fertilize appropriately. And number four is mulch. Number five, attract wildlife. <laughs> number six, uh, manage yard pests responsibly. And we'll talk about how that is so important when we talk about birds. Um, we don't wanna be using all those nasty pesticides in our yards um, to benefit the, the birds that really need those insects to survive. Um, number seven, recycling our yard waste materials. Number eight, reducing stormwater runoff, and number nine, protecting the waterfront. So we are definitely focusing on the attracting and supporting wildlife aspect of Florida friendly landscaping today. And the reason that's so important is that Florida is a very popular state. And because it's popular, it's becoming populous. So about estimated a thousand new people are actually moving to Florida every day. And this is predicted to increase with time and our natural resources are already being stretched thinner and thinner and it's really time that we start planning ahead now to make some positive changes for our future. We can conserve water by following the Florida friendly landscaping principles and we can all provide haven for wildlife in our communities to try to offset the loss of habitat that many species are experiencing due to the increases in the human population. So Florida's projected population level by 2060 is estimated to reach 36 million people. We've already surpassed New York State as the third most populous state, but the other two states are uh, California and Texas, which obviously have far greater land mass than we have here. We have a rather tiny, narrow little state here. Um, as you can see on this map of the projected land use for 2060, all of that orange in 2060 is all of that natural lands being converted into urban use. And that area is an area equivalent to the size of the state of Vermont, to put that into perspective. So it's really a significant amount of land that is going to end up being lost to development. And so this beautiful little bird is our only endemic bird in Florida that only lives in Florida. And it is a federally threatened species, the scrub jay. And obviously um, the greatest threat to him as well as to other wildlife populations is habitat loss and fragmentation. So how can we all help? Well, we can provide food and cover and water and space, the basic elements that wildlife need, uh, birds in particular, um, in order to survive and thrive. So the number one most important thing that we all can do is to install more native vegetation. Uh, planting these native plants in your yard will provide food and cover for all of these wildlife species. The, the wildlife, the birds have evolved with these plants. Um, so they provide each other exactly what they need. So it's really critical uh, to provide these native plants. Um, once established, these plants require less care and fewer resources, like in the form of chemical pesticides and fertilizers than their non-native counterparts. Um, they have better resistance to pests and diseases. Um, and in some cases, they are the host plants for many different insects. And those insects are absolutely the most important thing that, you know, most of these bird species really need to have in order to survive. Um, always remember, right plant, right place, and do your research before purchasing plants, because even native plants can be planted in the wrong place. So, you know, plants have wildly varying needs as far as water and, and pH in the soil. So you need to know that you're putting that right plant in the right place. Um, do keep in mind that native plants still do need to be watered in for the establishment period, just like any other plant. 
And turf has its purpose in the landscape for filtering and erosion control, possibly play areas for children and pets. Um, but turf, of course, provides very little in the way of food or cover for wildlife. And also, it kind of goes hand in hand with a lot of chemical um, inputs into it. So pesticides um, are often um, just part of the, the, the whole turf care regimen. Um, so, and that's definitely a, a bad thing when it comes to birds, obviously. So um, it, it can be very detrimental to the health of birds um, and, and by spraying, not only killing the insects, but also potentially poisoning the birds. Um, consider reducing mowing frequency in low visibility areas of your yard and let it become a more natural area um, with native ground covers perhaps taking over. Um, and definitely think about other alternative ground covers in areas that are difficult to grow grass, like under trees and sloped areas. And always try to create corridors or islands of native vegetation to provide food and wildlife um, and to break up the heavily maintained turf grass on your property. And if you have an HOA, always remember to get approval from your HOA, um, the Architectural Review Board, uh, we'll definitely want to have a say in the changes that you make to your landscape, even though the Florida Friendly Law um, protects you as far as being able to have a Florida Friendly Yard, um, your HOA still has some jurisdiction over how you do that. So um, please check with them first before you make any changes. Your landscape can definitely be a wildlife habitat, whether you have an HOA or not. Um, you may have to have it in the backyard, um, but you can definitely create a, a beautiful wildlife habitat. Um, the picture on the right here is one of our master gardeners, and she has a wildlife friendly certified Florida friendly landscape. And she definitely, she lives in an HOA, um, but she has an amazing wildlife friendly yard. Here are some other examples of what you can do to create a more wildlife friendly habitat in your yard. And really, we need to start thinking about our landscapes as being a part of the ecosystem rather than something separate from it. And this is our master gardener that I mentioned before. This is a drone view of her yard in the back. Um, it's pretty much 90% native plants. It's really amazing. She's even made it into the newspaper. It's such a striking landscape. So the islands of vegetation that I mentioned are very easy to create. You can just kind of um, mark it off with a garden hose or something like that and plan, plan it out with the native plants that you're going to be using. Uh, silver saw palmetto pictured here makes a, a wonderful anchor to such an island. Uh, it's a very striking plant with that silvery color. Um, and as you can see here, um, you can really put together a, an attractive combination of native plants. Increasing the vertical layering in your landscape is also very, very important for support excuse me, <laughs> for support, supporting birds. <laughs> um, so having a, a ground cover layer that is about six inches um, and then a foreground layer that is six inches to two feet high and then a mid-ground layer that is two to five feet um, followed by the, the background layer which is five feet and taller where your trees are going to come into play. Um, very important to create a, a more natural feel, which will definitely draw in more birds to your, to your landscape. Here's a few more examples of, of the vertical layering look. And native plants really do provide birds what they need. Um, and it's really important to realize it's not just the fruit that these birds provide, um, it's also the foliage that provides the cover and the fact that many of these native plants are the larval food sources for many caterpillars that are a major dietary necessity for many birds. Um, so pictured here is a Hercules club, which is a native plant that has some thorns on the trunk. It's the larval host plant for the giant swallowtail butterfly. Um, so 
you might be giving up some of your butterflies, your future butterflies to the birds, but that's just part of the food chain. The live oak is kind of the grand dame of the landscape. It really does attract and support pretty much everything, um, in insects and the insects that the birds will eat. The native firebush is a fabulous plant that has the tubular flowers that attract the hummingbirds, as well as fruit that is delicious for birds to munch on. The live oak provides food and habitat for an estimated about a hundred different species of animals. So um, if you have the space, um, definitely a live oak is a wonderful thing to have on your property. And if you have one already, it's a great idea to try to retain it if you possibly can. A little more detail about the firebush, Hemilia patens. It is one of the best shrubs for supporting wildlife. Um, the pollinators love it. Hummingbirds will visit it. Um, it's It can be in full sun. It actually tends to look a little bit better in the part shade areas. Um, you can get it from your local plant nursery, native plant nursery. Um, there are non-native varieties out there. I just want to caution you. Um, that are, I think, from Africa, you probably want to avoid those. Um, and you'll avoid those by shopping at your local native plant nurseries. Um, the hairs on um, the leaves are definitely more pronounced on the native one, and the leaves are a little smaller on the non-native one. But again, like I say, shop at the native plant nursery and you won't have to worry about that. So the ruby-throated hummingbird is one of the hummingbirds that you will encounter in Florida if you provide the right habitat for them. Some fun facts, um, they're definitely attracted to the firebush plant as well as other plants that have similar tubular flowers um, that are the nectar flowers. A grouping of hummingbirds is called a charm of hummingbirds. Um, and the ruby-throated hummingbird beats its wings about 53 times a second. Um, they build these really cute little tiny nests, um, but they don't even limit them to being in trees. Sometimes they'll nest on loops of chain or wire. Um, one thing to I'd like to alert you to, um, if you absolutely must use a hummingbird feeder, in Florida, um, our climate tends to make it turn very quickly to alcohol, which is toxic for them. So. If you are going to use one of these hummingbird feeders with a liquid in it, you want to definitely change out that liquid every single day because you don't want to be giving them something that is toxic. Also, never ever use honey with hummingbirds. It's toxic to them as well. And so it's definitely safer to provide these native nectaring plants that fire, you know, like firebush that are not treated with pesticides that the hummingbird can come in and passively feed from. The pigeon plum is a nice little underutilized tree that's a relative of the sea grape that's probably more commonly known. Um, the flowers are ideal for pollinators and it does get this nice fruit for birds and mammals. It gets to be about 30 feet tall with a 20 foot spread. It will thrive in full sun. It's dioecious, um, so that means that only the females will produce fruit. Um, and it may require training when young to avoid multiple trunks. And here are some of the birds that will enjoy that fruit. Um, we actually have a native pigeon, the white crowned pigeon. It, it really does live in South Florida. So I'm from South Florida, so I'm familiar with this bird. And I used to see it all the time in South Florida, but it's unfortunately um, in threatened status now, and it is considered an imperiled species. Um, but morning doves will also eat from them and as well as the um, feral city pigeons as well, um, which were actually brought here by European settlers as a, a food item. Native mulberry is another wonderful plant to add to your yard to feed the birds. Um, there is a monoecious one, so that means that you can get one that does have male and female flowers on the same tree. Um, if you end up with a dioecious one with the male and female flowers on separate trees, then you will need to have trees of both sexes in order to have fruit. 
Um, there's also a monoecious dwarf that's called the everbearing mulberry. And if you need a smaller tree, this is really the way to go. It stays small. It only gets to be about 15 feet high and it does produce fruit for several months on end. That's the one that I have. Um, and the fruit's smaller though, that's the only thing, um, but still quite good. On a mulberry tree, one single mulberry tree, you may see up to 20 different species of birds if you have a, a big native mulberry tree. And they do get up to be about 50 to 70 feet high. So we're talking about a big tree, but it's, it's a huge bird attractor. You might see the Northern Cardinal on it, the Great Crested Flycatcher, or the Red-Bellied Woodpecker, among many others. Cabbage palms, also known as sable palms, are also um, not only our iconic state tree of Florida, but also a wonderful wildlife plant. And it does have, in the springtime, these cascading white flowers, which will definitely support pollinators and also feed um, the birds that, that eat insects, as well as many frugivorous birds that are gonna be eating its fruit. Um, just be sure not to over prune them. A lot of times um, they're over pruned. You never wanna do that. Um, that takes away the habitat for the animals and it's very bad for the palms. The boat-tailed grackle is one of the birds that would be eating your berries on your sable palm. They are coastal. They're found on the shorelines of the entire eastern seaboard and all throughout peninsular Florida. A group of them is called a plague of grackles. Um, they are definitely one of those birds that'll be eating those berries, but they also are very fond of fishing old french fries out of fast food restaurant dumpsters, so they are definitely true omnivores. They're very intelligent and they can live to be more than 13 years old. The flatwoods plum, also called the hog plum, it is a valuable wildlife tree that's underused in landscapes. And it is an understory tree, which means it likes to live kind of in the shade, the company of larger trees um, to provide it with a little bit of shade. It is deciduous, so it will drop its leaves in the winter and then it goes into full bloom in February and it attracts many pollinators. And this is followed by the really tasty fruit, which can be really tart or really sweet. Um, it can have some thorns, um, but that actually helps to protect the birds that are feeding from it. So thorns are a good thing when it comes to bird plants. It does not tend to sucker as much as some of its closest relative uh, native plums. Um, so this one is one that I would recommend uh, for lower maintenance. And tent caterpillars will appear on this tree as its larval host. And the tent caterpillars are a really valuable food source. We really can't overstate the importance of the tent caterpillars for birds um, because so many of them will appear and the birds really, really need to eat um, an astronomical amount of caterpillars in order to survive and thrive. They won't kill the tree and birds will definitely eat them. The sweet acacia it blooms nearly all year long. And it's a nice little kind of lacy tree that allows you to see through it. Um, it does have thorns again, but the birds will perch happily on it and feed from the fruit and go after some of the pollinators that will come to visit the flowers. It gets to be about 30 feet tall. And the sea grape. This one is rather commonly used. So most people are, are familiar with this one. It's excellent as a large shrub or hedge and it can be trained into a medium tree and it is really an excellent wildlife supporter and even humans enjoy the fruit. At least I do. I know a lot of people who are not that fond, but. <laughs> All right, uh, marlberry. This is another understory. So it can be um, a shrub, it can be trained into a small tree, but it does like the shade of other trees. So this is another great one for shady areas of your yard. Um, the flowers attract pollinators and in spring, the purple berries are a great food source for numerous birds. And it gets to be about 20 feet high. Simpson stopper is another one that is a wonderful wildlife plant. Um, it 
if it's trained into a tree with age, the, the bark is this beautiful coppery color. Um, so it really does make a beautiful tree in time. And as younger plants, they're excellent uh, for cover for low nesting species of birds. And the flowers are uh, these little white puffs that are really attractive to pollinators. Um, and the orangey red fruit attracts the birds, um, which is in the late spring and fall. They can get up to um, 30 feet high in time and 20 feet wide, but they can be maintained as a lower shrub. And the painted bunting, the rock star of birds, may actually come and visit your Simpson stopper if you provide them. They migrate here in the winter and they do prefer that really dense sort of vegetation that the Simpson stopper offers. Um, a group of them is referred to as a mural or a pallet of buntings. They typically do not go north of South Carolina, but I just read that one was spotted recently in a park in Maryland. So that may have something to do with climate change, I'm assuming. Um, the oldest painted bunting to date found was 12 years old and was found in Florida. Unfortunately, a not so fun fact about them is because of their great beauty, male painted buntings are often illegally trapped and sold in large numbers in Mexico, Central America and the Caribbean and to a lesser extent in Florida despite efforts by conservationists. Beautyberry. This sprawling shrub prefers partial shade over direct harsh sun. It'll look a lot better if it's given some shade. It gets to a max spread of about eight feet high by eight feet wide. And the pretty blooms are bee pollinated mainly and these bright, beautiful purple berries that give it its name come in the fall through the winter, which help sustain the birds. The Eastern Towie is one bird that may well be a customer for this plant. It lives all throughout Florida for all of the year. They're omnivores who both nest and forage on the ground. So they like brushy shrubby cover. Um, they may visit your beauty berry plants in the fall and winter and they live rather solitary lives. Um, but if you see several in a the vicinity, they're called a tangle or a teapot of Towhees. And unfortunately, there is a jerky bird that is a parasitic nester called the brown-headed cowbird. Um, you bird lovers out there may have heard of this bird before, but it frequently lays her eggs in unsuspecting other species of birds' nests, sometimes taking out that bird's eggs and discarding them. And the swap is sometimes not even noticed by the mother bird, um, who then is left to raise the brown-headed cowbird's eggs and then feed the birds that hatched. So unfortunately, the Towies are um, often a victim of this <laughs> little scheme they have. Wild coffee is another wonderful native wildlife attracting native shrub. It's in the same family as firebush. Um, they love the white flowers which come in the spring and summer and they really, birds love the red berries that it pumps out. Um, this one really does prefer to be in the shade. In the sun it'll look kind of yellow and sickly. And the beautiful little gray cat bird um, is one of the ones that may come along and eat the berries. This guy is a ground forager, so he will also be foraging on the ground for the insects and your leaf litter. And a group of cat birds is called a mewing. The oldest known was nearly 18, found alive in New Jersey in 2001 and re-released. Um, it had originally been banded in Maryland in 1984. All right, cocoa plum. This large shrub uh, makes a nice hedge. Um, it can also be trained into a small tree. Um, it produces these fairly tasty, not bad plums. Um, I'm pretty fond of them um, that are delicious for birds. Blue stem palmetto is a great option for someone that's looking for a smaller palmetto than our iconic state tree, the sable. This one gets to be only about nine feet tall and about eight feet wide, and it only develops a very short little trunk. It has no thorns. Um, 
and it provides great food for wildlife as well as cover. And the same with um, its relative, the little scrub palmetto, um, sable etonia. This one is actually endemic to Florida. It lives nowhere else on earth other than Florida. Um, it's another little mini version. This one grows slowly to get only about six feet tall by five feet wide, and it doesn't have any thorns. And it produces that great fruit for birds. Saw palmetto is perhaps one of the greatest wildlife plants other than the live oak. Um, it can eventually take up a lot of real estate with its snaking trunks that it has um, if it's pruned back severely. Um, on an older one, you can see those snaking trunks um, down on the left corner. Um, it does provide excellent cover when it's left to its natural state of being bushy and it does have flowers that attract pollinators and fruit that attracts birds and this is the one that I mentioned before that is a great um, anchor piece for creating one of those islands of native habitat in your, in your landscape. More than 100 species of birds will eat saw palmetto berries and just a few of those are pictured here. The pileated woodpecker, the northern mockingbird, the American robin, and the bob white quail. Yopon holly is also an excellent wildlife plant. Um, but keep in mind they are dioecious, so the male and female flowers are on separate plants and only the females can produce fruit. Um, it's available in a dwarf form like Nana, um, which is only male, so no fruit on that one. Um, and also the, the striking weeping form, which is a cultivar called Pendula that's pictured here next to the house. Um, there are also standard tree forms available, um, but they are very excellent um, uh, berry providers. Um, the same with the Dahoon and the East Palatka hollies, uh, two other native hollies that produce a large amount of, of berries um, that will be very popular with birds like the cedar waxwing, which is quite a beautiful bird. A group of waxwings is referred to as either an earful of waxwings or a museum of waxwings. Um, and they will definitely pick your hollies clean if they happen to find your yard. Um, unfortunately, they're also a major pest to blueberry farmers because they really love blueberries too. Um, so be careful if you grow blueberries at home <laughs> with your cedar wax wings. Um, and actually, these guys are unusual for birds because the male and the female species look very, very similar. The Kunti, Zamia floridana, um, these guys set out this fruit, um, it is toxic for people and it's toxic for dogs. So you should consider that before adding a kunti to your yard, um, but mockingbirds and blue jays will eat the orange kunti seeds. And here's fun facts about blue jays. Blue jay feathers are not really blue. It's just the way the light hits them and the way that it's interpreted by our human eyes. Um, the male and the female blue jay also look very much alike. Um, which again is very unusual in the bird wo world. And this is called sexual monomorphism. And the opposite of this, which is the most common um, that most birds have is the sexual dimorphism. Um, the male blue jays are generally larger though. And of course, if you're familiar with blue jays at all, you know that they're very loud, energetic. <laughs> they can, they can um, imitate hawks to warn others of the approach of a hawk. Um, because hawks love to eat blue jays. Um, blue jays, I can tell you from personal experience, really love to eat mangoes. I have mangoes in my backyard and the blue jays just come and they start pecking at them and that ripens them. So essentially they're able to then eat a ripe mango um, completely down to the seed while it's still hanging from the tree. So they're very intelligent and are voracious mango eaters. Uh, the oldest known blue jay was nearly 27 years old. They're highly intelligent in the same family as ravens and crows, Corvidae, which is known for its intelligence. Most birds live to be only about five or seven years old, put that in perspective. Muley grass is a beautiful native grass that blooms um, in that really conspicuous pink spray of flowers in the fall. 
It's very tolerant of all conditions and the seeds will attract birds. Fakahatchee grass, same thing. It's also the larval host plant for the byssus skipper butterfly. So the birds will eat the seeds, the pollinators will visit the flowers, and the birds may also eat some of the caterpillar of the byssus skipper. And of course, it's a very low maintenance tolerant plant. The native passion vine, Passiflora incarnata, also called the maypop vine. Um, this native Passiflora, Passiflora does produce edible fruit, and it is also the larval uh, food source for native butterflies like Gulf fritillary. Um, so it will be absolutely covered in some cases with these caterpillars, which can do quite a, a bit of damage to the plant. It will not kill it though. And it, it creates a wonderful buffet for birds to come in and then snack on some of those caterpillars. So it's a great wildlife plant on many different levels. You can also, of course, add tropical fruit trees. They're not native, as long as they're not invasive. So as I mentioned, mangoes can be a good choice for that to keep your blue jays happy. Uh, loquat is another good one, star fruit. Uh, lychee, if you have the space for a lychee tree, they're fabulous for birds, as is the relative the longan, um, which I actually prefer over the lychee. And Japotacaba is another one that can be a great bird supporting plant that is not native. Here are a few um, nectar producing plants that will help you attract hummingbirds to your yard. The native tropical sage, Salvia coccinea, is a nice little wildflower that's fairly low growing. And the coral honeysuckle vine is another wonderful one. It also produces a fruit that birds love to eat, um, as well as the coral bean plant, Erythrina herbacea. And of course the ruby-throated is the most common hummingbird that you'll find in Florida if you're lucky enough to live in an area that um, supports them. They tend to avoid areas where a lot of construction is going on. So if you're in a new community with a lot going on around you, uh, you're gonna be a lot less likely to see them, unfortunately. Um, as I mentioned, you might wanna forego the hummingbird feeders. Um, it can end up being dangerous for them if it goes bad. It can become toxic. It can turn to alcohol very quickly. And also, what is that red liquid? It, it's not appetizing. I would not drink it. I'm sure you probably wouldn't either. So um, personally, I, I would say add the plants to your yard rather than um, this red uh, artificially colored liquid that can actually backfire on you and end up harming birds if you um, let it go bad. So again, um, you don't absolutely have to have all native plants in your yard. Um, you can add plants like fire spike, which comes in this nice magenta or the red color that also can attract and support hummingbirds as well as the yellow flowered necklace pod, which is a native. Most importantly, probably to stress to everyone is that birds really need caterpillars. Um, a chickadee that's the weight of four pennies must feed their young between 6,000 and 9,000 caterpillars in just 16 days just to get them to the fledgling stage. They bring caterpillars to their chicks every three minutes from 6 a.m. to 8 p.m. So think about that. If we all think we're busy, imagine that. Um, it, it's really mind boggling. And of course, if all of our yards are being sprayed, where are they finding these caterpillars? <laughs> so it's, it's no wonder that um, populations tend to be dwindling of many different species because not only are we adding, you know, housing developments in areas that are, were natural for thousands of years, um, we're also then coming in, adding all these non-native plants, and then we're spraying all these pesticides everywhere. So um, we really need to be more mindful of that and uh, try to provide them what they need. And a lot of what they need are caterpillars. Even a hummingbird's diet is 90%, 80 to 90% insects and spiders. And this is true of 90% of all land-dwelling birds. 
and so planting a pollinator garden is definitely also a benefit to birds. It's not just a benefit to pollinators. Um, they most birds eat a variety of fruit, seed, and insects. Um, many birds are um, primarily insectivorous, which means that they eat a diet mainly consisting of various insects. And also keep in mind that fruit is only available at certain rather narrow windows of the year. So um, birds can't be too dependent upon fruit for that reason. Um, so planting a thriving pollinator garden will help attract them and support them on all these insects that are being attracted by the garden. Um, and definitely keep in mind um, that spraying <laughs> is not a good idea. Spraying chemical pesticides is not a good idea. Um, let some damage occur to your plants rather than spraying them with chemical pesticides in order to help out the birds. And native wild, excuse me, native wild flowers are also a great component to pollinator gardens, and they also provide seed for the birds as well. Pollinator gardens just simply increase the diversity of life. Here are some of the main insect eaters, uh, goldfinches, hummingbirds, chickadees, titmice, or titmouses, I'm never sure what the plural is there, uh, cardinals, grosbeaks, warblers, blue jays, sparrows, thrashers, nuthatches, crows, wrens, you get the idea. Many, many, many species are really dependent upon having a diet heavy, heavy in insects. Um, bird feeders really should not be necessary if you provide the correct plants. Um, you know, it's up to you if you're going to provide a bird feeder. Um, there are some drawbacks to bird feeders that a lot of people are not aware of. So if you feel that you must use one, um, just be sure that you pick that bird feeder very carefully. Um, improper bird feeders can actually do more harm than good. If you look at this one that we have pictured here, it's really too much capacity, in, especially in our climate in Florida where it's so humid, it, it rains sporadically all throughout the year, even in the winter time. Um, there's a really high possibility of contamination happening with this because bird seed can become contaminated very, very easily, even when it's just damp and it can become toxic to birds when it becomes contaminated. So um, you want to avoid that at all costs. Um, you want to really choose a type that is not too much capacity like this. You don't want to be filling up this enormous thing and letting it sit out there for days being affected by humidity and moisture and possibly turning it toxic. Because the bad thing is we won't know, you know, if, if we accidentally poison a bird with toxic bird seed, it's not like they're just going to fall over right there. We won't even know the damage that we're doing. Um, so I want to caution you about that. Um, high capacity is really not what you want. You want the smallest possible capacity, really. And of course, squirrel proofing is probably a, a myth with that. Now, um, this is the best bird feeder that I have ever tested. Um, personally, I'm not like endorsing this product. I don't even know the name of it, but you can get the idea here. Um, I liked it because you can just fill up these little tiny areas here and see how it has a little perch for the bird there to stand on. And you can just fill in that little spot there. Um, and then the birds will come and eat that just that morning. You know, I'll put it out there before I left for work in most cases. And then by the time I got home for lunch, the, the seed was gone. So it's quickly eaten. There's no chance of contamination. Um, and another thing is, um, unfortunately, I it came across my radar that there was like this terrible lawsuit about, it was like this huge, um, class action lawsuit against a bird seed company because they were selling um, chemically treated bird seed. They were trying to keep it fresh by spraying things on it, but they were really creating a toxic product for birds and it killed, you know, who knows how many birds around the country. So um, if you want to be really upset, <laughs> you can Google toxic bird seed lawsuit and um, see what you think. Um, to me, it's a little risky to use these products. Um, I guess you could use like store-bought human grade um, organic, you know, sunflower seeds or something like that that are non-salted. Uh, if you if you really want to be really careful about bird bird feeding, so that that's up to you. Um, it, it's all you know, 
whatever whatever you feel comfortable with doing. I, I'm feeling much less comfortable about doing it. So I've kind of leaned more on the plants rather than the store-bought bird food for sure. Um, but here are some plants, if you, do, if you did provide a, a bird feeder, these are some of the plants, or some of the plants, some of the birds that might um, visit your bird feeder. The blue jay, the morning dove, which tends to hang out underneath them and, and pick up what's dropped. Um, the northern cardinal, the northern mockingbird, the tufted titmouse, and the pine warbler will eat some seeds, but generally they tend to eat more insects. Here are some resources for attracting butterflies and birds with plants, wildflowers, and here are some more native plant resources, the Florida Native Plant Society for one, and the um, Native Plant Nursery Association, and UF IFAS also has some great native plant literature um, as part of the Edis IFAS educational library. Okay, another really important aspect of this is leaving your leaf litter whenever possible. Um, leaf litter acts not only as a natural mulch, so it's very Florida friendly, uh, but it also provides this really ideal habitat for earthworms and other invertebrates who improve our soils, but are also really important food for birds. And many different bird species, um, that's their primary way of foraging for food is in leaf litter. Um, so it's really an important part of the soil food web. Um, if you have to relocate it if necessary, if your HOA or, or whatever your situation is is very picky about things like that, you may have to relocate it to a less visible area, but really do try to retain it somewhere on your property. And of course, removing invasive plant species is also very, very important. Um, they outcompete all these native plants that we really desperately need to try to keep the bird populations up. Um, they can also be spread very easily by the bird seed that the birds inadvertently eat and then spread everywhere. So nipping that in the bud is a really good thing by removing these invasive species. Brazilian pepper, of course, is really probably the worst offender. Air potato vine, also very bad. Carrot wood is another one that is out of control. Malaleuca, of course. Uh, rosary pea is a vine that is very bad as well. And of course, the Australian pine. If you need some help with invasive plant identification, here are some resources for that. And also, you can send them to your local master gardener plant clinic, um, either at, if you live in Manatee County, manateemg at gmail.com or to your local Sarasota County Extension office, depending on where you're viewing from. And if it's not a danger to life and property, try to keep a snag in place on your property. And a snag is actually a dead tree. Um, and our first instinct as humans is to try to remove a dead tree. But snags are extremely beneficial to animals, especially birds. Um, there are many species that, um, that only can survive if they have these cavities uh, in trees in order to nest with their young. So of course, if it's too tall or it's dangerously precarious, you're gonna to wanna to try to cut it down to a safe height, if at all possible, rather than removing it. Um, here are some examples of some snags that have been cut to a manageable size where they're not a danger. There are 25 different species of birds in Florida that use the cavities of trees um, and snags. Um, anything from large turkey vultures to owls, the endangered kestrels, and the little brown-headed nuthatch all use hollows of trees. Barn owl um, is one of our five species of permanent resident owls that will use one. Um, we also have the great horned owl, um, the barred owl, the screech owl, and of course the little burrowing owl, um, which is definitely a contender for my favorite bird list. And if you can't provide a snag, you can try nesting boxes. Sometimes you'll have to modify the hole, cut a, a larger hole with a, with a saw, um, a hole saw, so that larger species can get into it. 
um, but many species will use those. And you can even get handy dandy cameras in some of them, which would be pretty interesting. Um, providing clean water is also a very important part of this. Make sure that it's clean. Um, the lower the bird bath, generally speaking, the more open the area around it should be. Always ensure that it's clean and fresh and plentiful. And just the sound of running water in your, in your property will guarantee that you will have wildlife visitors. Um, it's easier to keep it clean by having a filter um, rather than having a still water container that has to be scrubbed out and cleaned every, every other day, but obviously that's more of a financial investment. Water sources should be near cover but not surrounded by cover. Um, so you want to have the combination of both visibility and nearby protection. If it's either too exposed or too open or too covered by densely, you know, dense vegetation, the wildlife will not feel safe. So think of the watering hole in nature documentaries. Um, it, it's one of the most risky activities for wildlife when they're drinking, when they're the most vulnerable. So they have to feel safe. Um, so these two bird covers, bird, <laughs> bird baths, sorry, here are placed near cover, but not inside it. So that's ideal placement pictured here. Space is also extremely important for wildlife because, of course, birds spend a significant part of their time flying through the air. So you can see how in cities this is very challenging for them with tall buildings. Um, so adequate open space is really a, a critical part of bird habitat. Um, it also is needed for raptors in order to scan large open spaces to hunt for rodents and other mammals. Um, and of course, for the insectivorous species who are going to be catching the insects while they're flying. Oops, sorry, I'm the wrong way. Okay, we're getting near the end here. Um, a few parting thoughts that are for the birds. Um, birds are definitely under threat. Worldwide, there are approximately 18,000 species of birds with an estimated one in eight um, to be considered under threat of eventual extinction. Over 179 species of birds have already become extinct and at this rate, and this rate of extinction seems to be increasing. Um, one really, really important thing though I wanna leave you with is please don't feed the wild animals, actively feed them. Um, there have been many stories of the sandhill cranes being fed by someone who did not know any better. And then they've come off the golf course and they've broken through the screen and they've attacked their cushions, ripping the stuffing out of their cushions. And of course, people get angry with the bird, but really it's only because this person was feeding that bird and drawing them to their property. The bird didn't understand. <laughs> so it's tempting to want to feed them. I know it is, but actively feeding them is not helping them at all. It helps to associate humans with food. It makes them lose their fear of humans, sometimes making them aggressive. Um, it can cause them to end up in dangerous situations like parking lots, looking for handouts. And also in many cases, the people are feeding them like hot dogs and bread. These are not good for them at all. So it's really far better to just leave them alone and enjoy their beauty from afar and never ever actively feed any sort of wildlife. And very importantly, you want to try to expand the scale of habitat within your control. Um, many wildlife species definitely require a larger habitat than what can be provided with your yard. So you can talk with your neighbors and your HOA board members about creating larger wildlife habitat patches within your community. Um, and these connected areas will hopefully invite more species into your neighborhood. Reducing and eliminating the use of pesticides. I hope by now I've convinced you that that is a really good idea. Broad spectrum insecticides eliminate many insects, including pollinators, and reduces the food source for birds and other wildlife that need those insects to survive. Systemic pesticides are particularly bad. They stay in the plant for weeks. There's no safe time to spray them. 
um, and use integrated pest management techniques in your landscape, which includes scouting for pests, learning to recognize beneficial insects, removing affected leaves or plant parts by trimming them off um, rather than spraying them. And if you must spray, you can spot treat by using low impact products like horticultural oils. And if you must use pesticides, use the least toxic method you possibly can and read and follow all label instructions. And the type of mulch can actually matter as well. Mulches that are labeled as mixed hardwoods are often made of scrap woods that are broken down from pressure treated wood and pallets and other chemically treated woods. Um, then they are typically dyed either red or black or brown. And so these mixed hardwood mulches can actually contain dangerous chemicals in some cases. Um, creosote, CCA, which is chromated car, um, copper arsenate, among others, which can be toxic to the invertebrates that live in the soil beneath it. So when birds, when birds go digging for insects underneath this mulch, they may find that all the insects are dead or what is there could possibly harm the birds. So we also do not recommend using cypress mulch. It is not a sustainable product because cypress mulch are really beneficial native trees. So we don't wanna kill them to make mulch. So we do recommend uh, flora mulch which is made from invasive melaleuca trees, and that's the image of it over there on the right, or pine bark mulch or pine straw. Those are the three sustainable, safe mulches that we do recommend. Another important part of this is keeping cats indoors to protect wildlife. Based on extrapolated data from Wisconsin, feral and free-ranging cats in Florida may be killing as many as 271 million small animals and 68 million birds each year. Loose dogs will also harass and even kill a, wild, a wide variety of wildlife species. And top 10 tips for landscaping for backyard birds. Limit the lawn and leave the leaves. Increase your vertical layering between trees, shrubs, and ground covers. Provide snags and brush piles if possible. Provide clean water. Plant native vegetation for natural food sources. Provide bird nesting boxes if appropriate. Remove exotic invasive plants. Reduce or eliminate pesticide usage. Expand the scale of habitat throughout your community if possible. And control pets outside. All right, I'm sorry that we did go over. Um, I knew we would, because I just couldn't stop adding slides. <laughs> um, Thank you, Susan, that was a great presentation. A lot of resources, uh, yeah, beautiful pictures, and we have a bunch of comments and questions for you in the chat box. Okay, so Thank all you all right. for this. So, so I'm gonna go ahead and start asking you, um, first of all, do you mind putting the first resource slide that you had some people wanted to take notes from that slide so we'll ask you questions. Oh, okay. All right. Okay. Let me go back. Uh, so one of the questions we have is about a particular species of bird. Is the painted bunting common uh -huh. in Pinellas County? It is the painted should... bunting common? Mm -hmm. It should be, um, it would be migrating in the winter. Uh, so it does live in Florida in the winter. Um, it should be throughout most of, of Florida. I know there have been spottings of it um, over here near us in Palmetto. Um, there's an Audubon Park that it has been spotted. So I'm, I'm sure that it, it would be in, in Pinellas County as well. Cool. And somebody said that they have painted buntings in their yard for two years now. So that's great. And there's oh, ways that, wonderful. yeah, there's ways that if you sign up for networks of uh, bird watchers and there's a bunch of groups that they can, they notify when they see birds. So you can try to go see them and spot them as well. Um, oh, that's the, right. Yeah. The, the next question we have is about mealworms. Is it safe to feed or is it bad to put mealworms in bird feeders? Um, it's one of those things where, you know, they, they could potentially also go bad if they're there long enough. Um, they, they could turn. So, you know, it's one of those things where you use your own judgment, but just know that there's a potential that harm could, could be associated with it. All right. 
the next question, which is a very interesting question. When you were talking about the snack, somebody asked if man-made snacks can be used. So basically like an old Christmas tree can be sunk into the, buried into the ground to use a snack. Um, uh, yeah, as long as it's made out of completely natural materials like an old Christmas tree, I would think that would be fine. It would definitely start to decompose um, more rapidly than a, a, a snag that was rooted into the ground. But um, sh sure, that might be a good way to recycle a Christmas tree <laughs> for as long as it lasts. Sure. Cool. Well, we have a bunch of comments, people saying that what a very nice and very interesting presentation. And somebody asked, what is your yeah. favorite bird? Oh, it's such a hard question. Um, and why? Yes. Well, the one that always pops into my head is the the simple little tiny titmouse. And I don't know why that's, I always go to that in my brain because I'm just so fond of them. The little noise, the little squeaky noise that they make, that little peep that is, it immediately tells me there's a titmouse nearby. Um, and I just love, they're just so tiny and cute. So I don't know. I don't know what it is. I'm just so fond of them. <laughs> they are cute. <laughs> People want to know also if this can be shared, the presentation. I told them that we were going to share the video for sure, but um, I don't know if you can make a PDF available for people, but it seems like people would really want to have this information with them. Yes. Um, if, if anyone's interested in that, if they could type in their information into the chat, um, I can definitely make a PDF out of it and and send it to your email. Susan, do you mind putting your contact information uh, a slide so they can email you as well? Ah. And I do have a question. I, sure. My, my, one of my neighbors have rat problems and they put poison and then we saw the bunch of the hogs that we used to see, they were gone. Do you have oh. any recommendations for, for, or where can we find more information? I would love to provide information for my neighbors about that. Just oh, gosh. Um, e yes. Um, but let me, if I may get back with you about that. Mm -hmm. um, sure. I have been working with a community that had that same exact problem, and they have found uh, a couple of workarounds for that. Mm -hmm. um, exact same problem so let me let me share that cool. with you after yeah sure thank you yeah that was so <laughs> selfish but i need that info. <laughs> oh no no not at all no that's a well, great I'm not question seeing, no thank you Susan. so i'm not seeing any more questions here uh, unless you want to share okay i also want information about palm rat control so somebody wants that information as well it seems like it's a big an issue in some areas but um yeah great job Snakes. snakes. Snakes are yeah, wonderful. Mm -hmm. Encourage Racers. the snakes for for controlling rat populations. Oh my gosh. Snakes eat so many rats. You really want to get over your fear of snakes and invite as many snakes, native snakes, into your yard as possible. <laughs> if, if That's you have great. A rat and we do have information them. about that at Extension Office. And so either the Manatee County Extension Office or Sarasota County Extension Office, if you need more information about wildlife in your backyard, from birds to snakes. We have all those resources. Um, Susan already gave you a whole list of plants that you can put in your backyard. We do have more documents and information available to you. So just stop by the office and either Master Gardeners or Susan herself and all the agents will help you with questions about plants. But thank you so much, Susan. This is a great presentation. I think we got you know, a bunch of resources, very useful and great job. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> I All right. We'll see it. you next time. Uh, and don't don't forget to, to visit our website to see what more classes and presentations are coming up ahead of, in the future. But um, yeah, we'll hope to see you again in our program and have a great afternoon.